One day in 210 BC, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of United China, set out on his fifth and last inspection tour of a territory he had conquered. He fell ill on the way. Knowing the end was near, Qin Shi Huang sent a letter to his eldest son, Fu Su, ordering Fu Su to meet him in Xianyang and preside over his funeral. Qin Shi Huang died in Shachou Prefecture in July 210 BC. It was at the end of the line for the monarch who had unified China. His youngest son, Hu Hai, Prime Minister Li Se, and Chief Eunuch Zhao Gao accompanied the emperor for his last inspection tour. Prime Minister Li Su decided to hide his death by placing the emperor's body in the chariot behind the curtain, serving him meals and water to fool the other court officials. Zhao Gao forced Li Su to alter Qin Shi Huang's instructions he sent a messenger with a sword to Fu Su, falsely accusing him of a crime and ordering him to commit suicide so that Hu Hai could become emperor. The caravan took a deliberate detour on the way to Xiangyang to allow time for Fu Su's death. The long, hot journey caused Qin Shi Huang's body to begin decaying. Li Se and Zhao Gao bought several carts of abalone to ride along with the caravan to conceal the odor of the corpse. Li Se and Zhao Gao learned of Fu Su's death as the caravan was about to enter Shanyang, so they let it be known that Qin Shi Huang had died. Qin Shi Huang's decaying body was hastily buried in the mausoleum in September that year. After a brilliant career, Qin Shi Huang made an undignified trip to the underworld empire he had carefully crafted. In October, Hu Hai declared himself to be Qin Ar Shi, the second emperor of Qin. Hu Hai, the 18th son of Qin Shi Huang, illegally seized the throne that belonged to the eldest son. He knew that all his older brothers had more right to the throne than he did. So Hu Hai had his 12 brothers and 10 sisters murdered in Xiangyang and then dismembered. Prince Gao prepared to escape, but he worried about the fate of his relatives. Instead, he asked to be buried at the foot of Mount Li, and his brother granted his request.
His brother, Jiang Lu, was also executed under false pretenses. They all wept before their execution. They were buried in the mausoleum with the emperor. Qin Shi Huang would never have imagined that his children would join him so soon in his underworld empire. With the collapse of the Qin Empire and the passage of time, this shocking massacre has gradually been forgotten. In October 1977, archaeologists found 17 more graves east of the mausoleum, inadvertently opening up a window to the bloodshed of 2,000 years ago. The bones in these coffins are in disorderly heaps. Some leg bones are partially buried with the skulls placed on the lids of the coffins. Some of the skulls were left outside the coffin and other bones were placed inside. More peculiarly, the limb bones of one skeleton were separated from the rest of the skeleton and carelessly thrown into the coffin with the skull outside the coffin. These bones have since been removed from their graves, so their original look cannot be seen today. A careful study of the skeletons revealed a broken arrow shot into the right side of one skull, obviously pre-mortem. All signs indicate that the deceased in this tomb died of unnatural causes. The disorder of the bones and unearthed artifacts indicate that most of these buried here were executed and dismembered. Given the historical facts and unearthed evidence, one cannot help but think of Hu Hai's palace massacre. These probably belong to the princes, princesses, or royal clan ministers killed. Scientific examination shows that the skeletons, but one, belonged to males around 30 years old. Except for a young woman of about 20, it is unlikely they all died of natural causes at the same time. The owners of these tombs were very likely the victims of that palace massacre. After the princes and princess were executed, Hu Hai ordered that all childless concubines be buried alive with Qin Shi Huang. Most concubines were childless, so weeping could be heard throughout the palace. Soldiers forced the childless concubines deep into the emperor's mausoleum. Some of the concubines killed themselves in desperation, and others fainted with fear. Most of the concubines were hysterical, so Hu Hai ordered workers to seal the underground palace with the concubines inside. Thus, Qin Shi Huang was accompanied in death by hundreds of his doomed concubines. The building of the mausoleum required 720,000 workers, 
most of whom spent their entire life in the mausoleum. Often, characters can be seen engraved on the terracotta warriors and horses. This terracotta figure bears the character of Qin from Xianyang. Artists in the Qing dynasty engraved their names on the products they made as a form of quality assurance. These old characters may be able to tell us about the fate of ordinary people back then. Chin from the capital Shenyang was a famous local potter who was conscripted to help build Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum. He was responsible for the production of the terracotta army. Everyone knew that being sent to Mount Li meant becoming a slave of Qin Shi Huang. There was no chance of escape and even the person's children and grandchildren would become slaves. Chin oversaw the work of 10 or so ordinary workers. The workers under Chin would first make the head from a mold, then add a neck, ears, hair, and a hat on it. The workers then turned the head over to Chin. The face would then be carefully sculpted and modified until it began to take on a unique look. More detail is then added to the hair and beard, giving the finished head a lifelike appearance. The head was then secured to the torso, finishing the terracotta figure. Chin then engraved his name on the figure's body to show it was his work. He could be punished or even beheaded for poor workmanship. He therefore always had to do his best. After firing, a terracotta warrior was finished. Since Chin varied the appearance of each terracotta figure, they seemed to be modeled on actual Chin soldiers. It took 38 years to complete the mausoleum and over a decade to create the terracotta army. Chin may well have spent more than a decade in the terracotta army workshop. There were many artisans working alongside Chin. 
Archaeologists have so far discovered the names of 68 terracotta artisans. Ordinary people like Chin made these many lifelike terracotta statues under threat of death. The fine details of the terracotta soldiers gives you a sense of how meticulous they were in their work. Residents from Yao Chertao village, west of the mausoleum, recalled finding human bones at a smooth area of land in August 1978. Archaeologists immediately arrived to inspect the bones, which were found about 200 meters northwest of the village. Scraping off a thin layer of soil with a small shovel revealed white bones buried on the side of a ridge. Archaeologists determined that they were all human. Rib bones, leg bones, and skulls were all found with none of them arranged in a complete skeleton. Archaeologists speculate that this was a place where bodies were simply dumped. In winter 1979, archaeologists probed 159 tombs at another village west of the mausoleum. They found as few as one and as many as 14 people buried in each grave. Next to this graveyard is a large area where bones were buried in layers. The bones are of mature men and women, as well as teenagers and two children. Except for some tiles covering the bones, a few of which carried writing, there were no items in the tombs. These tiles carry personal information about the deceased, including name, birthplace, and criminal record. The tiles revealed that many of the mausoleum builders came from Shandong, Henan, and Jiangsu. The place names on the tiles included Gan Yu County, Jiangsu, and Wu Chang County, Bo Xing County, and Zhou County, Shandong. The names on the tiles included Qingji, Niao, Qibi, and Tang. In several cases, the tiles mentioned that the deceased had been fined for breaking the law. When he was unable to pay the fine, he had to pay with his labor. Archaeologists concluded that these were the mausoleum builders. The inscribed tiles served as their simple tombstones. The graveyards found at the two villages are southwest of the mausoleum. The latter is only 700 meters from the outer west wall of the mausoleum. The former is about 1,200 meters from the outer west wall of the mausoleum.
This crude and hasty graveyard was the final destination of thousands of mausoleum builders. Archaeologists believe that many other artisans died in the underground palace of Qin Shi Huang. set a deadly trap to keep the underground palace secret. He called together everyone who had worked on the underground palace and told them that they would be rewarded. But there was no reward. Instead, the soldiers locked thousands of workers in the palace to die. They were sacrificed for the glory of Qin Shi Huang. The people who created the underground palace became members of the emperor's underworld empire. As the supreme ruler of the underworld empire, Qin Shi Huang also planned to deal with political affairs. Many burial pits have been discovered that contain terracotta soldiers, stone armor, civilian officials, bronze chariots and horses, terracotta entertainers, rare animal figures and stables, waterfowl, and sacrificial victims. But these pits were only a small part of the mausoleum complex. Archaeologists estimate the mausoleum complex covered about 56 square kilometers. The pits themselves cover about 20,000 square meters. The center of the mound is sealed by inner and outer walls. The spectacular terracotta army could be considered an almost negligible part of the entire complex. The jewel of the mausoleum complex is the underground palace under the huge mound, which is mound to be both huge and grand. The great monarch who unified China, Qin Shi Huang, lies in this splendid palace. The mausoleum itself has not yet been excavated, so only historical records can provide some possible answers. China's greatest historian, Sima Qian, of the Han Dynasty, described the mausoleum in records of the Grand Historian. He reported that they dug through three springs, plugged the fissures with copper, and then built palaces with places for officials and rare treasures. There are mechanical traps in the mausoleum. A river of mercury runs through the palace, and the ceiling is decorated with astronomical signs and the walls with nature scenes. There are candles made of mermaid fat to burn forever. Sima Qian's record and the hypothesis of archaeologist Wang Shui Li indicate that the underground palace is probably in a giant rectangular pit.
The bottom of the underground palace covers about 19,200 square meters, equivalent to 48 regulation basketball courts. Pavilions, verandas, galleries and halls are carefully placed on the pit wall. The upper part of the underground palace is surrounded by a square city wall. Sima Qian wrote in records of the grand historian that there are candles made of mermaid fat. This mermaid probably referred to the giant salamander. The mermaid might also refer to a whale, like the big fish Qin Shi Huang is said to have killed in the East China Sea. Whales have a lot of blubber that can be used to make tallow. Candles made of mermaid fat allegedly burn forever, eternally lighting the underground palace. In 1981, geologists from the Chinese Academy of Sciences probed the mausoleum of Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Their tests showed that there was a lot of mercury in the mausoleum. This means that Sima Qian's description on mercury is credible. The rivers, lakes, and seas of mercury in the palace would likely be patterned after the Yangtze River, Yellow River, Dongting Lake, and East China Sea because they represent the territories he conquered. On the ceiling of the underground palace is a moon and stars made of pearls. Qin Shi Huang's coffin faces east and lies on a land with rivers and lakes. This is the center of the underworld empire of Qin Shi Huang. It is as great as the Qin Empire he founded. But the great emperor will not be able to conquer the world again from his underworld empire. Archaeologists do not know what kind of condition Qin Shi Huang's body would be in after more than 2,000 years have passed. In addition to the greatest emperor in Chinese history, the mausoleum complex was also the burial place of government officials, warriors, princes, princesses, and concubines, as well as the workers who created it. In life, they came from all walks of life, but they are all equal in death. They no longer experience the splendor and glory or pain and humiliation of life. For more than 2,000 years, they have remained buried together in the mound.
时间开启一幕幕的画面，它见证了时间的变化和你我的蜕变。纵使停下了脚步，我们已成为时间中的一枚符号。Anhui Province has long been known for its breathtaking scenery. Jiuhua Mountain, a Buddhist sanctuary, is one of its natural treasures. But very few people know that the province is also home to another great attraction. Shuzhou is a land of idyllic beauty, and one can only wonder how many years it took Mother Nature to produce such wonders. And there's a village here famous for the longevity of its residents. Shuzhou Municipality is located in Anhui's southwest. The area has a very long history. The Imperial Court of the Tang Dynasty set up a prefecture administration here over 1,300 years ago. Shuzhou has helped nurture some of the nation's greatest literary minds, earning it the nickname "the Land of Poets." And its storied history has also made Shuzhou an attractive place to visit. Shuzhou's idyllic beauty stems from its many natural sites. The forest on Guniaojiang Mountain is one of China's best preserved primeval forests. Guniaojiang Mountain is located at the junction between Shetai County and Qimen County, 22 kilometers from the county seat of Shetai. It's the main body of the western extension of Yellow Mountain. The mountain side is dangerously steep, and its chasms deep. Very few people have scaled the peak. But its isolation has helped preserve its natural wildlife, which has been largely unaffected by human interference. In 1999, the local government built a 90-meter-long path on Guniaojiang Mountain above Longmen Pool to help tourists feel at ease, and from here, tourists can see the broad Longmen Pool Gorge. The gorge is more than 100 meters long. The rainwater from the main peak at Guniaojiang Mountain gathers in Longmen Pool, where it forms into a stream. It's then joined by water from other streams to become a narrow river. The river runs over huge boulders along its 1,000-meter-long course through the valley. Here, there's a suspension bridge that provides a spectacular view and a way across. Rocks of various sizes and colors are scattered everywhere. The yellow granite rocks were washed down from Yellow Mountain by floods. The giant grey limestones are seabed deposits that formed 400 million years ago. Geologists call this kind of natural rock formation a karst landscape. Thanks to the age-old strata and its complex topography. A rich variety of wildlife from the Tertiary period and the early Quaternary period can still be found on the mountain. Vegetation coverage here can reach as high as 95 percent. Many have called Shetai County a place full of treasures. Beyond the primeval forest on the mountain, there lies a small village whose residents are known for their remarkable longevity.
three rural villages, Shetai County in Chuzhou, Ziyang County in Shanxi Province, and Enshu County in Hubei Province, are famous for their rich deposits of selenium. Selenium from the village in Shetai is the easiest for the human body to absorb, and for this reason, it's been acclaimed as the number one selenium-rich village. Due to the high content of selenium in the villages, soil, water, plants, trees, and even domestic animals, traces of this valuable element can be found everywhere here, including in the tea leaves. The area's tea leaves are becoming more and more popular among those who pay careful attention to their health. One of the most popular varieties of selenium-rich tea is Wu Li Qing tea. The leaves are processed with whole, tender, and large buds. The best Wu Li Qing tea leaves can fetch a price as high as nearly 6,000 yuan a kilogram. Yet, despite the exuberant prices, they're still highly sought after. It's a two-hour drive from Shetai County to Nanshi Village, which is nestled in a valley in Dongzhou County. Nearly 800 people live in this mountain village, and 70% of them have the surname Jin. As many claim that they're descendants of a Han king, they're referred to as the Last Han Tribe. The village's rock-paved road is flanked by houses of an unsophisticated architectural style, once popular in Anhui province. We can hear birds chirping on the mountains, but very few people are out in the open. The Jin clan ancestral hall is also called the Da Chang Memorial Hall. It was built in the Jin clan's heyday in the year 1583. The Grand Hall is divided into three sections. With an arched roof, the Memorial Hall looks rather like a giant Mongolian yurt. Every pillar is secured on a block of stone and carved with designs symbolizing the vast grasslands. Scattered on the walls in the main hall are portraits of ancestors of the Jin clan. In the courtyard, there are blocks of stone for mounting horses and posts for hitching them. In the outer wall, there are even Hun-style peepholes. Due to the pressures of modern civilization, the Hun language was eventually lost. Traditional customs have been lost among the younger generations, but elderly villagers have preserved many of the customs passed down from a time when the Huns roamed the grassland. On the 13th day of the 8th lunar month, villagers hold sacrificial ceremonies to honor their ancestors, drive away evil spirits, and pray for happiness. Most of the homes in Nanshi Village feature traditional Anhui architectural features. Excluding the peepholes, the homes are very similar to the southern style of Anhui province. Only this watchtower in the heart of the village bears traces of the Huns from an age long gone. The Huns were tough, fierce and brave warriors. They slept in yurts as they prepared for battle across countless territories, but most of the time they slept in watchtowers to maintain vigilance against raiding forces. This 1,000-year-old watchtower has weathered the ravages of time. The wall at the corner still looks like a sharp sword. Houses with horsehead-shaped gables topped with grey tiles in the Anhui style are seen everywhere in Shuzhou. The ones found at the foot of Lotus Peak have remained intact. An ideal Anhui-style home should be one with a mountain and water. Its layout should be harmonious with its surroundings. As the ancient Chinese saying goes, a house built in a place without a mountain or water is not fit for living. In ancient times, most of the houses in Anhui province were built close to a mountain and water. The people also built pavilions, terraces, towers, and exquisite bridges over streams to beautify the area where they lived.
The raw materials used to build ancient Anway-style structures were usually brick, wood, and rocks. The main part of the construction usually centered around its wooden framework. Another outstanding feature of Anway-style homes is that many are arranged around two courtyards. Rainwater comes through an opening in the roof into a pond. Such a layout represents the philosophy advocated by Anway merchants, whose sole purpose was to gather wealth. After touring Anway's old homes, one may gain a better understanding of the cliché, how time flies. <laughs>